Hey guys, and welcome to the week three edition of the Fantasy Points UFL Breakdown. I'm your host, Jake Tribby. I couldn't be happier to be back for week three, and I'm joined by my co-host, millionaire maker winner, and one of the greatest spring football DFS players ever, Neil Orfield. And as our YouTube viewers have likely noticed, we have a very special guest this week, Justin Freeman from Run the Sims. Justin is one of the best spring football DFS players ever, a master of single game showdown slates, both spring football and NFL, and he's out here still grinding spring football, despite welcoming a new baby to his family just a few weeks ago. Justin, congrats again on the baby. How are things going, man? You know, I've got a long track record of sacrificing my family in favor of spring football. It wasn't that long ago we all hauled in the uh, car down to Birmingham, Alabama to watch some spring practices and sneak into Legion Field and watch uh, Jeff Fisher and his guys uh, see see what order they were taking snaps with the first team offense. So, uh, yeah, this is old hat for my wife, but things are things are going good, man. Thanks for asking. That's awesome. I can't I can't think of a more perfect guest than someone who's willing to pack the whole car, uh, pack the whole family into the car and drive down to Birmingham. Uh, Neil, what about you? How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm a bit sleep deprived and, um, you know, just uh, scatterbrained a little bit. Like so, so if I forget a name or something, uh, bear with me. But but overall, I'm ha happy to be doing the DFS show. Uh, happy was happy to be uh, enjoying some Masters Golf until Everybody I wanted to do well is doing terribly. Everybody I wanted to do poorly is crushing. It just, it has not been going well for me today, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun week. Yeah. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the masters if only because I currently live in Augusta, Georgia, and it is impossible to get around uh, yeah. right now in Augusta where it's normally pretty easy. Not a big, not a big traffic city out, outside of one week a year. Um, but all right. So before we get into, you know, these games, I did want to revisit our discussion about stacking for hopefully probably the final time this season. And I do think it's very important that we revisit this discussion for this particular slate because it really helps set the stage for things. We haven't seen the field lean into many game stacks this season, but week three figures to be very different. The St. Louis at San Antonio game is going to be right there as the highest owned game in spring football history. It's relatively easy to make DFS lineups that use five or six skill position players from that game. And that makes this a tricky slate from a game theory perspective. So, Justin, very curious, how do you generally handle stacking within your spring football lineups? And does your stacking strategy change for you in a week where we can safely assume the field will be playing a ton of St. Louis and San Antonio game stacks? Yeah, I, I tended to always prioritize team stacks more than game stacks in spring football. Um, with there only being four games uh, in the course of a given slate, you're not really looking for like this mega ceiling outcome to even get you into first place. Uh, you really are just kind of hoping to avoid stepping on landmines. So uh, whereas like on a 16 game NFL slate, that math works out completely differently. Like, you know, one of those 16 games or 13 games on a Sunday slate or whatever uh, is bound to pop off and you better get as many pieces out of that game as possible. Here, it's more like which offenses are going to play competent football. Let's hitch our wagons to those. Let's maybe limit our player pool, you know, for any one particular lineup to maybe coming from like no more than three teams. Let's maybe try to think about how to uh, need as few competent offenses to show up as, as necessary, because what we've seen across the board is – a lot of offenses that look like they're stuck in mud a little bit, a lot of offenses that have failed to show a really big ceiling. So that really, um, I think that's exactly why St. Louis San Antonio is so appealing this week because the two most obvious teams to stack happen to be playing against one another when, you know, really everyone else across the board has been underwhelming. Now it seems like you almost have to get off of it. Uh, if you're going to play in anything that's relatively large field. Yeah, yeah, I think I think those are really great points. I'm I'm curious, Neil, do you have any, you know, adjustments to your sort of general stacking strategies because we know the field's going to be so heavy on one particular game this week? Yeah, I think Justin laid it out really well. Um, I think it is going to be like so many people are going to be just game stacking that so many teams are going to have all their PMR going into the final game of the slate. And it makes sense. Those are just two the two best offenses in the league, I think. Um and I feel like the if you want to get away from that, I, I'm not sure the other stacks that I'm interested in playing have multiple receivers that I'm confident in. So I think that I'm going to be actually stacking less this week as the field is probably going to be stacking more. I'm probably going to be getting away from that game more than the field does. And as a result, because I don't like the other double stacks with the other teams, I'm probably going to be doing a lot more single stacking this week. Yeah, I probably see myself leaning into game stacks on that particular game pretty pretty hard. Um, but then also, you know, dabbling in some some Memphis, some DC, 
uh, maybe even some Houston stacks. We'll, we'll talk about all that later. But I think that really helps set the stage because this is a very unique slate from the perspective of projected ownership. And because that that big game in terms of, you know, uh, San Antonio, St. Louis has all the players who want to play because it's the last game of the slate. We're also going to get a lot of late swap flexibility, which is going to be really big in making lineups this week. Again, we'll we'll discuss all of this in more detail once we get to that game. Um, but first, I want to tell you guys about the Fantasy Points UFL DFS product. Here's what you get. Player projections, main slate ownership projections, an exclusive UFL DFS Discord channel where you can ask me, Neil, Chris Weck, Johnny Proctor questions about the slate, access to my UFL articles, which will be behind the paywall every other week. And I wanted to emphasize the Discord this week. It's a great place to tilt or just talk about the games. I know DK DFS, who we had on the show last week, is it's always in there tilting. Um, and I'm basically in there 24 seven to answer questions and drop whatever juicy nuggets I have. They can't quite make their way into our free content. It's probably the most underappreciated aspect of our UFL product. And we have both a free channel, which anyone can join. That's UFL general and a paywall channel in there. That's UFL DFS. So there really isn't any excuse. Uh, not to hop in there. Uh, and subscribing is an even better deal for week three because promo code UFL2024 now saves you 15% off either our UFL subscription or our all access package, which is just an incredible value. Again, that's promo code UFL2024. All right. Uh, let's talk about these games. We're starting things off Saturday at 1 p.m. That'll be when the slate locks. DC Defenders at the Arlington Renegades. DC is a one-point underdog. Total here is 43, which is actually the highest total on the board. Um, Justin, I'll throw it over to you. Any any bets you're interested in here? Yeah, I don't quite get where that total's coming from. Uh, Furby and I like to try to guess the lines ahead of the games each week before the lines come out. I guess it at 39 and a half. Uh, I don't think this game's going to be particularly high scoring. Like, uh, both teams seem to be missing just a little bit of something. Uh, defenders are getting a lot of plays in per game. Their pace is really high, but uh, not being totally efficient with that. Luis Perez just having trouble sort of setting up a, a real rhythm with any of his pass catchers. Tyler Vaughn's getting loaded down with targets, but we're just not seeing a lot of pop, not a lot of pizzazz. So, um, yeah, I would kind of lean towards the under here. I have not bet the under, but I did take Arlington plus two earlier in the week. That line's now flipped where uh, Arlington's the favorite by a point. Uh, I, I also kind of wanted to point out the fact that, like, the, the more I've thought about how these games are likely to play out, especially as long as they stay relatively lower scoring. I think the value of that one point or getting to one and a half points or something like that, um, right around that, that margin of zero is going to be so effective. I think you're going to see a lot of games end in one point victories, like because sort of the nature of the sport with the, with the three different conversion uh, links is going to, put it in position where that team that scores last has all that information and can then leapfrog by exactly one point, which is exactly what you would do in that type of situation. So just thought that is like an interesting kind of game theory angle that I'm sure sports books are not quite pricing in yet, but yeah, the, the line I like is no longer available. I'm not sure I touch the side anymore at this point. Uh, I think Arlington who's 0 and two probably got a little bit of a bad rap early in the week. So I was happy to hop on them and, and get a little CLV. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I'm pretty much in line with you there. I managed to get the under 44, and I also hit under 43 and a half on uh, two separate offshores. I think there's probably still a 43 and a half you could find out there if you if you look around a bit. And yeah, I see a little bit of value on the DC side. I think your analysis in terms of one point victory is very very sharp. Uh, Neil, any any bets here? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I love that analysis. Had not thought about that, but that that is really sharp. Um, I, I like the under. If I'm taking anything in this game, I'm. I, I don't understand how this game has a higher total than the Brahma's game. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll take the under here on 43. Great. All right. Uh, starting with the DC side of things. Oh, actually, we have a couple injuries to get through before we get there. Um, so on the DC side, Kiki Cutie is out with a groin injury. That's pretty big news. Brandon Smith and Cameron Harris both suffered minor in-game injuries last week, and they were limited in the first practice of the week. But then they logged two full practices and are fully expected to play. The Arlington side is clean. Um, starting with the DC side, uh, Jordan Tayamu was pretty much the only quarterback I didn't write up in my UFL article this week. And that's just because I feel perfectly neutral about him. Um, you know, I think he's a, he's a solid play. I have a hard time making a great, you know, upside case for him. I have a hard time making, you know, a great case that he's you know going to be overowned, especially because I think we only have him at about 7%. He's not going to be super popular. Um, 
Justin, I'm curious kind of how you're viewing these DC pass catchers, especially now that Kiki Cutie's out. It's, you know, I think we can roughly give Chris Rowland that role, but, you know, things are a little murky. Yeah, we spent a lot of time debating how to project Chris Rowland this week because uh, I think he's the guy who most obviously uh, moves up in the depth chart. Complicated a little bit by the fact that Vincent Smith looks like he'll be active for the first time this year as well. Uh, he's been dealing with a hamstring for the first two weeks at the name Vincent Smith sounds vaguely familiar to anyone. He was a fringe player for the Jets for a little bit of time. Um, probably lost you some money at 200 bucks on Showdown uh, in NFL at some point. So, yeah, it's it's TBD. Uh, we've seen Ty Scott make plays out there as well. But I love Chris Rowland. I have such a soft spot in him uh, uh, from his time as a Philadelphia star. Like, he was, he's kind of an awesome possession receiver uh, with a little bit of burst as well. So, um, I think he could be the exact type of player that DC needs to sort of maintain some continuity on offense. I don't know how he's going to end up projected or kind of across the, the industry, if you will. Uh, but overall, like I think if he's not popping for me, I want to make sure that I, I try to insert him into at least a few lineups. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's it's interesting this week because we do have a good amount of value on the board. So you really don't need to get to a guy like Chris Rowland, but I could certainly see an upside case for him. I mean, Cutie has had, you know, the best pass catching role in this offense thus far. And I, I think most of that likely goes to Chris Rowland. Um, Neil, what's kind of your take on Jordan Tayamu, these DC pass catchers here? Yeah, as you may recall, I was really into this team last week. This is a team I, I had nearly 40% Jordan Tayamu. And for a little while, I felt really, really good about it. Did not end up working out. I love that he came in solo owned, but obviously uh, didn't score, didn't convert on like a one yard uh, a goal line touchdown opportunity. Uh, missed Kiki Kuti, or actually Kiki Kuti dropped what would have been pretty easy touchdown. Uh, so things did not go well last week for the defenders, but they were, they've always been kind of a hit or miss team. Like they have games where they just will put up multiple touchdowns, put up huge scores. Uh, and then they have games where they have duds as we've seen twice, but you know, but both the games so far, they've been pretty bad, but I still like the upside in this team. I still think that I'm into Jordan town at 7%. I'm not going to lean into it as hard as I did last week, just because there are other, low owned quarterbacks that I like kind of on par, or maybe even more than Jordan Tamu this week. But I do think that I'll be overweight to 7% Tayamu. Um, it's, it's, I don't love that Kiki Kuti is out because that was part of what I liked about it was Kuti was also really low owned. Like in high stakes, he was like 4% owned. And I thought this guy might be a star in this league. I, I think it's, it's sort of still unclear. And he was targeted nine times last week. Uh, as I said, dropped one that would have been a touchdown, ended up being pretty bad. Um, so I, I wish that Cootie was still in, but even with Cootie out, I, I kind of like the idea of Tiamu Rowland uh, seems like a reasonable stacking partner um, at, at the end of the day. I think I'll be overweight to Tiamu, but not nowhere near the 40% that I had last week. Yeah. And we still, you know, kind of loosely expect Kelvin Harmon and Brandon Smith to occupy the vast majority of those routes on the outside. So they are, they are certainly viable. I think Ty Scott would have been really interesting if Brandon Smith had ended up missing this game, but you know, just hard to project him for a decent role, even though he is earning an incredible amount of targets relative to the amount of routes that he's running. Uh, he's a guy that I would kind of expect to come on a little bit later in the season. Um, and yeah, just, you know, like I said, I, I feel very neutral about Tayamu, so I will probably, you know, roughly match sort of our, our projected 7% ownership. They're not a guy I want to completely fade, especially because, you know, ownership's going to be so concentrated on that last game, but not a guy I'm super excited about. Um, this backfield, I think, is is quite interesting. You kind of look at the game logs from last week and you would think the team, you know, really leaned in favor of Darius Higgins, but it does need a little bit more context. Um, so Cam Harris drew the start and he played virtually every backfield snap until the four minute mark of the first quarter. He didn't appear hobbled, but he did signal to trainers that he needed to come out of the game and then was seen on the sideline, sitting down and talking to trainers with, you know, it was listed on the injury report as a right knee injury. I'm sure that's what he was discussing with trainers. He then missed every backfield, uh, snap for the remainder of the first quarter and the second quarter, but then started the second half played two drives, missed a full quarter, came back in in the fourth quarter and actually looked fine. He ripped off a 20 plus yard run and and looked decent. So I'm not exactly sure what to make of DC's backfield usage last week because it is very clouded by that Cameron Harris injury. Um, yeah, Justin, I guess I'll throw it over to you here. How are you guys kind of viewing this backfield? Because for us, we have pretty close to a 50-50 split projected, but I think you could make an upside argument for either Hagens or Cameron Harris. Yeah, we're, we're projecting it a slight bit in favor of Hagen's, uh, particularly in the, on the route running side uh, as well. So 
Yeah, it, like you mentioned, there, there's really a that was a great breakdown of context uh, for sure that that we need to apply to this. I think overall, like there's a lesson here to be learned about the fact that uh, coaches aren't married to these roles with these players, and like we we hear like rumors of hot hand in the NFL. Uh, UFL is like a true hot hand situation. I mean, if Cameron Harris gets stuffed for you know less than five yards on his first three carries. Uh, yeah, they're going to give Higgins some some burst, and Higgins could very well start this game. We saw that last week with Mateo Durant in St. Louis. Like, uh, didn't quite see that coming, but uh, all of a sudden, just they they played a different guy. So I think it's absolutely could go either way. Uh, I am probably more likely to play Higgins uh, for for like salary based reasons if I had to pick one. But overall, like, and this is kind of a, a meta level argument as well, which is that. Um, we should probably only be playing one running back in these lineups until we see something different from these uh, running backs across the league. It's been really poor play uh, in the rushing game. So uh, not looking for a reason to jam these guys. Yeah. Uh, these, uh, you know, these running backs have been absolutely brutal in terms of efficiency and overall drafting scores. So yeah, I'm not super eager to play either running back, but I, I would agree with Justin. I, I lean in favor of Darius Higgins in part because of the salary savings and because I mean, you know, regardless of who draws the start, I, I think Justin's right. You know, the hot hand will probably prevail here. And I, I think I'd rather just lean into the guy who we know is hundred percent healthy. Um, granted, I'm not sure how much that's really worth after Cam Harris, um, you know, just got two full practices in. And I think you could make an argument that Cam Harris is just the guy if he's healthy and he could push for a 75% snap share. Um, so yeah, it could really go either way, but the median's probably something resembling a 50, 50 split. Uh, Neil, what's, what's your kind of take on this backfield? I think I like it a little bit better than either of you do, just because uh, running backs are so bad across the board that uh, when I can get a low owned running back and, and seeing we have uh, Cam Harris projected for 5.7% ownership to me at 7,500, that's still pretty interesting. I would imagine I am going to be higher than the field there. We have Darius Higgins at 15.7%, which seems reasonable. I think I, I would probably be close, maybe a little bit under the field on Higgins, a little bit over the field on Cam Harris would be would be my guess and just hope that it was injury related and that Harris will actually have a bigger role coming next week. And we, we saw last week, I mean, Darius Higgins ran 17 routes to Cam Harris is 13. Uh, so he was, you know, running more routes, also had more carries than Cam Harris. But we don't know if that is related to like the, what, what the coach wanted to do or if that was just because Cam Harris was injured. So I think that I have some interest in Cam Harris and it, it obviously it helps that I think the the best game that we've seen by far for a running back this year was Mateo Durant last year against this Renegades defense. So it might be a defense that we can run on a little bit. I want to, you know, at least uh, test that hypothesis just because I don't feel confident in any running backs in this league right now. So uh, might as well take a shot on low owned running backs against a defense that just got torn up last week. So I think that I will probably be a little bit, maybe I'll have 10% of each where I'd be, you know, split, splitting the difference between the two approximately. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially for showdown. I, I can't imagine these guys will get steamed as as captains, but they're both very viable captain plays because, you know, again, either guy I could see pushing for a 75 percent share of, of backfield snaps and, and usage, which is certainly certainly worth something in in showdown. And, you know, of course, for the, the main slate as well. Um, all right. Moving on to the. Arlington side here. Um, this offense is a little tougher to project now that, you know, we've seen Lindsey Scott uh, hop into a bit of a bigger role. Bob Stoops noted in their postgame press conference that um, he really liked the spark that Lindsey Scott gave him. They have a lot of plays drawn up for Scott. They anticipate giving Lindsey Scott more work as the season goes on, uh, especially in the red zone. That really hurts Davion Smith, who um, you know, his entire fantasy value comes from scoring touchdowns. Also not great for Letty Brown. Also not great for Luis Perez. Um, this is a pretty tough spot for me to, you know, get behind Luis Perez lineups, but I do still think he's viable for the main slate. Um, Justin, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts on this Arlington passing attack, the impact of Lindsey Scott. It, it just kind of feels like a mess to me right now. Yeah, I think you can't really play anybody there. And Day Day Hunter will be active as the third running back for Arlington this week as well. So that's another layer of confusion. So um, I think this team's looking for a spark in the run game. Uh, Davion Smith is like two two yards in a cloud of dust every time he touches the ball. It's it's not pretty. 
Uh, all upside gets sapped out of Perez. And Perez is going to have to have like a 300 yard passing day and like put all these in, put all these touchdowns in the box from way out of distance uh, to have, you know, a, a viable fantasy score. Otherwise he's just going to kind of like hover in the 13 fantasy point range and, and just not really offer a ton of upside. I think really there's, there's not a lot to, to see here the, the targets go through Tyler Vaughn's, um, you know, I think everybody else is competing for for second place behind that. I was hoping to see Isaiah Winstead get a bit more run in week two after having that big play in week one. Did not see that. Um, so overall, like a, a team that could use a little bit of spark, I would have I would have thought that you'd give that guy a bit more chance. Uh, but the, this, the ball's getting spread around a little too much outside of Vaughn's. I'm not super excited about playing anybody there. Yeah, yeah, I, I pretty much mirror that uh, that sentiment. Um, Neil, are you interested in any Luis Perez stacks on the main slate? I don't think so. I, I and I've I've done it both of the past two weeks. Uh, it takes a lot for me to not want to play a three point seven percent owned quarterback on a four game slate, uh, especially when like I don't think that the talent is that much worse than everybody else, and he has you know fifty seven pass attempts over the past. I, I just. I think that I'm giving up kind of outside of Tyler Vaughn's. I don't know that I'm going to play much of this offense at all. Um, yeah. It's really hard to make a case for anybody here with outside of Tyler Vaughn's. Nobody's run more than nobody ran more than 22 routes last week. Uh, as, as Justin noted, the the running backs is just, it's ugly. It was already ugly. Just like the yards per carry. And now they're adding a third running back. Uh, now I, I think this is mostly a stay away spot for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that makes a ton of sense for what it's worth. I mean, Javante Payton, I think is a somewhat interesting value and we know he has, you know, a pretty great ceiling at 4,500, but you know, Tyler Vaughn's does really feel like the only viable pass catcher for the most part here. I I'll probably just be playing him. He's going to be really popular. We have him around 25% owned. Um, and I'll, I might sprinkle in a little bit of Javante Payton because they love throwing deep shots to him and he is a pretty great like speed, you know, downfield threat receiver. We saw him drop 30 in the uh, XFL semifinals last year. So, um, you know, you could make an argument for him, but it, it, it does feel a little thin, especially given that, you know, Perez just hasn't really been able to connect on most of these deep shots so far this season. Um, I think it's safe to say that the backfield is is pretty much dust here. I, I really don't think we need to spend any time on it unless you guys have a take on Davion Smith or Letty Brown. You could make an argument for Letty Brown for salary reasons. Uh, he had a decent score in week one, but overall, like there's there's a bunch of those guys this week that I think are essentially RB twos that could have closest to RB one type loads, uh, but overall, like represent a little bit of uh, you know, a pretty low upside. Yeah, I think like we'll talk about Ricky Person later. Uh, you know, a guy who's in a similar type of position but on a much better offense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think Person, Hagens, uh, even John Lovett are are stronger plays than Letty Brown. But I guess you know if I was if I was maxing the fifteen dollar, I, I would probably have a little bit of Letty Brown. Um, all right, moving on to our second game of the slate. This game kicks off Saturday at seven p.m. Eastern. It's the Memphis Showboats at the Birmingham Stallions. Memphis is a seven point underdog here. Totals forty and a half. Uh, to me, I really couldn't believe that Memphis was this big of an underdog uh, seven just feels like a really big number. I have seen a few like heavily juiced seven and a halfs out there. Um, Neil, I'll throw it over to you. How do you kind of feel about these, these betting lines um, is, is Memphis as undervalued as, as I may think they are. I think so. I think that you are correct. I, I would take the points with Memphis if I'm taking anything in this game. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, they have a pretty decent offense, I think. So I, I think I'm with you. I'm, I'm taking, taking Memphis with the points. Yep. Uh, Justin, what about you? Same here. It took Memphis in the points uh, earlier in the week. Also took uh, plus 280 on the money line there. I, I think there's a perception that the Stallions are kind of uh, untouchable, but you know, this is spring football. I mean, everything, anything can happen. Uh, I, I like that number a lot as a money line bet. Um, at Case Kirkus is a competent quarterback. Something you can't say on the Birmingham side of the ball, like that – they could absolutely implode offensively if they don't improve at the quarterback position, figure out, figure one out. Obviously they have a different uh, starter this week. We'll see how that goes, but uh, no, I like it. I mean, if, if Memphis somehow doesn't blow their 12 point lead last week, then they're sitting two and oh, the spread does not look like this. I thought it would open at three and a half in favor of Birmingham. 
Yeah, yeah, that's sort of what I had. This seven number feels like, you know, Birmingham against Arlington or Birmingham against Michigan, not exactly Birmingham against Memphis. Um, as much as I hate betting against Birmingham because they do have just incredible coaching, yeah. um, this this does feel like a, a pretty good spot. And I did grab Memphis plus seven. And I think I'll, I'll tail Justin on the, on the money line here after the show. Um, all right, injuries on the Memphis side. Backup tight end Wes Saxton is out with an ankle injury, so J.J. Wilson will be the showboat's tight end too. That really doesn't matter much for fantasy. Uh, but Darius Victor missed two practices and then logged a limited session yesterday with an ankle injury. He's listed as the starter on the Week 3 depth chart, but his official game designation is questionable. The Birmingham side here is clean. Um, I guess that leads us nicely into this Memphis backfield. Um Justin, how are you guys kind of looking at this Darius Victor situation? Because it is a little cloudy. You know, he finished the game last week. That said, he's he's looked terrible. Him being hurt obviously won't help the efficiency. Titus Swen has looked pretty good. You know, this team is clearly looking for some sort of a spark in the in the rushing game. But, you know, Darius Victor has been getting by far the best workload of any UFL running back, at least by weighted opportunity. It's translated to him only averaging eight DraftKings uh, fantasy points per game. So... Yeah, this this feels like a really tough spot for me, a pretty difficult spot to project right now. Yeah, I think so. What we're going to get is maybe our first uh, look at what happens with game day inactives in the UFL. They do. They've done a great job, honestly, so far this year in communicating uh, inactives uh, well ahead of game time. Um, But typically those have been for non injury reasons, like guys who are just kind of uh, not not talented enough to make the the initial roster. What I think you're going to get here is like possibly a one hour before lock type of announcement on Darius Victor that he's been taken out of the game, in which case that clears it up, adjust your lineups, rerun your projections, rerun your lineups. Uh, But you kind of want to have a plan in place if you're going to have Victor in your lineups. What what do I do if one hour before lock we get news that he's out? I think if he's in, he's playing and he's going to manage a full role. Like I don't see a, a world where like he goes in and he's, you know, uh, you know, just kind of hedging a little bit or break glass in case of emergency. Um, and, and if he does miss, then I think there's, you know, he's priced up enough and there's enough late uh, running backs after him that you can switch to pretty easily. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think you have to like go to Titus Swin necessarily or Trey Williams, although you could and, and upgrade somewhere else. But I think Swin's the primary beneficiary of Victor Sitz. But overall, like, <laughs> It's a great workload, and if he keeps getting it, then uh, it's it's eventually going to work out for him. Yeah, yeah. He uh, reminds me a bit of like even, an even more inefficient version of Joe Mixon, um, mm-hmm. where you know the, the workload's pretty strong, and you're just kind of banking on that regression. And you know, for Mixon, we saw what two seasons ago he had that 55 point game. Uh, I'm not sure Victor's capable of something like that, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a big game given that his workload has been so incredibly good. Um, if Victor does sit, I mean, I'd have Titus Swen as easily the best points per dollar play of the mm-hmm. slate. Um, this is a team that has historically leaned extremely bell cow heavy. They, they clearly want a featured running back. Um, they run a ton of plays, ton of plays in the red zone. Um, so it would be a really, really great role for Titus Swen. Uh, Neil, do you have any takes on this uh, this backfield before we get to the Memphis passing attack? Yeah, I mean, I think if Victor is out, if we learn, especially if we learn after the first game in particular, uh, Titus Wen would be an absolute slam dunk, both from a point per dollar perspective, just a ownership perspective. I don't think that a lot of people would be adjusting uh, to yeah. that news. So, um, yeah, I, w- I would be slamming Titus Wen yeah. if Darius Victor is out, especially if it the, the later we get the news, the better um, as far as that goes. And if we don't get that kind of news, um, I, I think I'm with Justin. You kind of have to assume that Darius Victor is going to get the full workload uh, and he will be one of the better plays on the slate. Seven, you know, uh, last week, 17 rush attempts, ran 24 routes, had three targets. Like the, the, the volume is just so good for Darius Victor. Um, I think that I would be above, above the 11% that the field is at if he plays. I'm debating whether in the absence of news, if I would want to play some Swen lineups without Victor and just kind of hope that they just didn't announce it, which does happen sometimes in spring yeah, football, yeah. you just you just don't get the news. Or, you know, it could be, there's always, uh, re-aggravation is always a possibility. Uh, so Swen would still be maybe a little bit in play for me, although it would obviously not be a slam dunk. It would be kind of a galaxy brain. No yeah. running backs are good, so might as well play a running back who might be good kind of a play. Um, so, yeah, I, I think regardless, uh, I will play some Swen, but 
if Victor is out, he's going to be a slam dunk. And, and if Victor is in, obviously I'll have some Victor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I think playing some Swen definitely makes some sense or leaning into, you know, maybe a Swen captain lineup on the, on the showdown slate, something yeah. like that. We'll probably go pretty underappreciated if we don't get any news. And yeah, of course, if, you know, if we find out Victor's ruled out, I'm, I'm jamming in as much tight a Swen as I can, as I can possibly fit. Um, all right. This passing attack, I think is, is really interesting, at least to me and our ownership projections kind of back this up, you know, obviously San Antonio, St. Louis, they're going to soak up most of the ownership. And then there's a pretty clear third or second tier. You could say, uh, occupied pretty much exclusively by case Cookus and this Memphis passing attack. Um, I had a tweet earlier that, uh, Memphis has by far the most red zone plays in the league. They've accounted for, I believe 26 of 26% of the league's red zone plays, yet they've only scored 6% of the league's offensive touchdowns. This offense is sort of begging for some positive regression here. Uh, they've been horrifically inefficient in the red zone, but they run a ton of plays. They have a super high pass rate. Cookus has looked pretty good outside of, you know, pretty consistently under throwing, uh, deep balls. He's, you know, he's a competent starter clearly. Um, so yeah, Justin, I'll throw it over to you. How are you kind of looking at case Cookus this week? Um, you know, is he, is he the ideal pivot off of the San Antonio, St. Louis chalk? Couldn't agree more. Uh, Cookus 100% the, the pivot I would go to right off the bat, uh, to fade the, fade the other game, um, has a lot of attractive options. I think like Daywood Davis is going to come like preloaded in all case Cookus lineups. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to think whether or not I give myself permission to come off of him. And I, I don't know that I do. Like sometimes in spring football, like you just got to take a free square if there's one to be had. So in games where Cookus does well and you're going to stack that, uh, I think playing Davis makes a ton of sense. He's a target earner. Uh, unlike, say, Jonathan Adams, the other full time starter. Uh, who's going to see about half as many targets on the same number of routes. It's it's just kind of wild how Adams has just he, – he's kind of a one-trick pony. Like if you want to uh, toss him a ball near the sideline and have him go get it, then, then yeah, it, it'll work out. So I don't mind Davis and Adams together, Davis and Papali together, Davis and Surratt together. But uh, I think Cookus with Davis I think is obviously uh, a really strong starting place for those uh, Cookus lineups. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much where I'm at too. Um, Daywood Davis, really the only receiver we're seeing from Memphis who's consistently involved in every area of the field. He's getting, you know, he's getting screens. He'll get pop passes. He might get a handoff. He's getting mid-range targets. He's getting deep shots. I believe he leads all players in air yards. Not that he's going to realize most of those because Cook just keeps under throwing them. Um, but the role is really, really strong. I said in my article, I think the only two players who would be favored to average more DraftKings fantasy points per game for the remainder of the season are Darius Shepard and Jontre Kirkland, um, because that's how good Daywood Davis's role is for Memphis. Uh, Neil, any thoughts on this Memphis passing attack? How do you think you're going to handle this for tournaments? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I've mentioned a couple times that, like, I'm going to be playing a little bit less of the final game of the slate and more of other games. And I feel like it's it's a good opportunity now to, to make, like, kind of a macro point, which is you look at the team totals. We have the spreads or the team totals go from 38 to 43 points. Like, there is not a widespread in actual team totals, and yet everybody is going to be jamming one game. I think if I wasn't a Brahmas fan, I might just, like, completely fade the quarterbacks uh, in, in the, the chalky quarterbacks because – everybody's playing the quarterbacks in the game that has a total of 42. Well, there's a game with a total of 43 and the others are 38 and 40 and a half. So like they're, they're really not all that different and everybody's just going to be jamming one game. Um, and so I think I'm going to be underweight to the two quarterbacks in the final game and overweight to a lot of other quarterbacks And case Cookus, Yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you. Both of you guys, 16% ownership. I'm going to be over that number. He does have 71 pass attempts already on the year. And we like, the pairing options, as you said, Daywood Davis uh, looks great. Another 38 routes run, nine targets last week, really put it together. I think that I I am willing to play some lineups that have Cookus without Daywood Davis. I am also, I'm, I'm a sucker for routes run. I, I think, you know, I, 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 I fall for it uh, regularly. I played a ton of Kelvin Harmon last week. Um, and, you know, he, he was still out there running routes. But um, I'm going to do it. Justin Watson lineups uh, this NFL season. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just a sucker. So I don't know. And I I, I just hope, you know, that there's going to be, this is the, the UFL in particular. I do it for, for NFL too, but uh, also for UFL. You can just hope for some broken plays here and there. Like being out on the field matters because, a cornerback just might not might forget about a wide receiver like that. Things like that are more likely to happen in the UFL, more broken plays. Uh, so Jonathan Adams, I really like. He ran the most routes on the team last week. He is 8,200. You have to pay up to be contrarian, but we have him at 3% ownership. He did still see five targets. So even though he's not 
on Daywood Davis's level. He did see, you know, a reasonable number of targets. Uh, so I will be, that's the spot where I will be paying up. I'll probably play some single stacks that are just Cookus to Jonathan Davis. But but like like Justin said, yeah, yeah obviously you can do the double stack. Uh, you can play him with Daywood Davis. Uh, looks great. Even Sage Surratt, I mean, 32 routes run, six targets last week. Uh, Vinny Papale, 27 routes run, five targets. So I think there are a lot of solid stacking options with Case Cookus. I think that I'm going to be definitely above the field. I don't know if I'll be like double the field on Case Cookus because there are some other really low owned quarterbacks that I like. Um, but I, I will be above weight to the field on Case Cookus. Um, and I, I think you can play any of those four. Jonathan Adams, David Davis, Sage Surratt, Vinny Papali, all pretty interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. I'm in a similar spot. I think I am going to be overweight on Cookus. Uh, my one note on Adams was that, you know, Surratt and Papali actually lead all players in red zone targets. So you could certainly make an argument that they have the best touchdown equity on the team or are right there with David Davis as having the best touchdown equity. But just from like rewatching these games, it does seem like the team is pretty eager to try to get, you know, like a three step drop, first read, immediate throw to Jonathan Adams. And it just hasn't quite been there a lot of the time because he's not as good as sep at separating as, um, you know, certainly day with Davis. So I, you know, I think there's probably more touchdown equity for Jonathan Adams than what, you know, some surface level stats may tell you, but that is more of sort of a, a more of an anecdotal um, piece of evidence than something I can really back with, with hard stats. Um, all right. On the Birmingham side, Adrian Martinez is the listed starter here, but I don't think that matters much. I mean, we know it's going to be some kind of a split between him and Corral. Um, and really every single position on this roster is a split. This team is rotating tackles. They're rotating guards. They're rotating every defensive player that isn't Marcus Gilbert. Uh, Coach Holt said that everyone who's on their active roster, they trust. Everyone who's on their active roster is there to get film so that they can play in the NFL one day. And they intend on getting every single player on their active roster film. That's, you know, great for those players. And if I were a player, I'm not sure there's a coach I'd rather play for than Skip Holtz. Really bad for fantasy, though. Um, Justin, I'll throw it over to you. Is there anyone on the Birmingham side that you have interest in this week? We can start with the pass catchers, but... Um, yeah, feel free to talk. Uh, about it. Yeah, interest in certainly, uh, conviction okay. in definitely not. <laughs> as it kind of all to your point there. Um, yeah, it, it's that honestly. I'm, I'm glad to hear that exact phraseology. I think a lot of spring coaches would be uh, well suited to follow suit in terms of like trying to rotate bodies and get guys filled. And it, it, it pops up in the routes run data uh, for, for all of these receivers, especially like you've not seen a single receiver top 67% of the routes in any one game uh, at any point this season so far. Uh, even Jay Sternberger, you see him like getting taken off the field for like large stretches of time. And maybe this changes down the stretch for the stallions. Like, once they kind of get an opportunity to find out who's got what it takes and, and who doesn't, maybe, maybe that changes a, a bit, but overall, like I think it's the running backs here that I'm looking to play CJ Marable. If I want to pay up and Ricky person, if I want to, uh, to pay down and just save my money to blow out with four wide receivers. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that the quarterback situation is a little interesting. Like they're, they're tipping their hand and saying they're going Martinez to start. I do think there is a world where Martinez could just sort of take over and maybe Corral only gets like two drives or something like that uh, in sort of an upside scenario. And Martinez will score fantasy points when he's out there, like, and, and in big chunks too, right? So, you know, a, a two rushing touchdown day with, a, you know, 60 or 80 rushing yards or something like that to go with it. That's all it takes. And, and he's got uh, a pretty strong fantasy day, tackle a little bit of passing on top of that. And it's all gravy. So, yeah, I, I think this is um, – it, it, Martinez is a really interesting spot. The problem is, like, there's not an obvious guy to pair with him. And on top of that, like, you, you kind of hope he doesn't fill it up passing. Like, you, you hope he just has a monster running day. So it's tough tough to make a really strong plus EV lineup with Martinez, but uh, that, that doesn't mean I want DJ out and, and toss a few out there and see what happens. Yeah, I think I think that's a pretty interesting take. I'm kind of trying to figure out what direction I'm going to go on my non, you know, San Antonio, St. Louis game stacks. And, you know, I think an unstacked Martinez lineup certainly makes some sense. If I were to pair him with anyone, it would it would probably be Deion Kane. I mean, he's clearly the best, the most talented receiver on the team right now, the best target earner. Um, but, you know, like Justin said, no one on this team has basically any hope of earning a route share over 70 percent, which is pretty tough. Um, and then I think both these running backs are, are pretty solid plays, not guys I'm, you know, over the moon about, but, 
Um, you know, I think Maribel, especially on a slate where I think the, you know, the standard chalk build is going to be St. Louis, San Antonio with one of the cheaper running back options, just playing Maribel as your running back is going to force you into a more unique build. Um, and you know, he, he projects pretty well for us. So, um, I think that's, that's reasonable. Ricky person also, also fine, but, uh, for what it's worth, Ricky person has run significantly, uh, or has run way better than expectation on touchdowns relative to Maribel. Maribel leads all, uh, running backs in red zone touches per game. Um, he's like, uh, I compared him to Deandre Swift where he's just, he keeps falling victim to the most efficient one yard play in professional football In Deandre Swift's case. It's obviously, you know, the Eagles tush push and in Maribel's case, it's the T formation for Birmingham. Maribel will get some of those T formation touchdowns. They just happen to have gone to person so far. Um, all right, Neil, uh, do you have any interest in the Birmingham side of things? What do you think about maybe a, a more galaxy brain Martinez uh, team? Any, yeah. any thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, this is, a, you know, to, to, to use uh, Drew Drinkmeyer's what do you win when you win? I feel like with Martinez, as Justin said, there is at least some chance that Martinez just takes over and is the the lead quarterback, you know, takes most of the snaps, if not all the snaps. He looked so good last week. Like, it would not shock me to, to see them lean more on Martinez. Uh, he's so good on the ground. Um, he, you know, had some nice throws last week as well. So at 8,300 and 1% ownership, I feel like you get 25 points. That, that would be what, what do you win when you, when you get 25 points out of Adrian, Adrian Martinez at 8,300 and 1% ownership, it would just be awesome. So yeah, I'm, I'm into it. I will be above weight to the 1% Adrian Martinez. I don't think that I'd play more than like 10% at the most. Like I think 5% is pretty extreme. You could, you blame one, one of your 20 lineups. You're probably just fine with Adrian Martinez, but I will be taking some shots on him. I think that I, I could see myself getting up to around 10% Adrian Martinez. Uh, I do think this is a spot where you look at the pass catchers. I'm not usually one to say that I like, I wouldn't play these pass catchers outside of a stack. Like usually I'm like, if they're good enough, you don't necessarily need the quarterback. I think this is a case where I don't have any, like Justin said, I don't have any conviction in any of these pass catchers. Uh, so I think if I'm playing any of them, it is going to be in a stack with Martinez. Uh, but I think you could play any of, honestly, Sternberger, Amari Rogers, Gary Jennings, Deion Kane, I think are all sort of somewhat in play in a single stack or, or double stack if you want to go that crazy. I probably won't. But uh, in, in your stack, if you want to play Adrian Martinez, I think all are totally fine. And I, I think I'm with you. I would probably um, lean Dion Kane if I'm only playing one. But he's also the only one who's going to get any kind of ownership. Jay Sternberger, I think, is still fine at 5,900. I mean, we saw him in game one. He was the one. I mean, Jake, you made the point last week that he was one that they were targeting early and often in week one. Now, they didn't do it last week, but it's at least they did it one of the two games. Um, so I think that he is in play um in in those those stacks with martinez yeah sternberger's uh week one usage at least early on in the game was was quite encouraging but yet yeah, you know it's just tough when they're they're even rotating him out he did have you know excellent touchdown equity in the 2023 usfl so i would still consider him viable my my final note on uh, martinez before we wrap this up and move on is that you know, he's an excellent runner, but I mean, man, he just cannot read the field at all. Like going through his, he's going through his reads incredibly slow. He's almost always checking down. Um, that makes me a lot more willing to just play him unstacked uh, because I think, you know, most of these pass catchers just don't project well enough and probably don't have as much of a ceiling relative to a lot of these other options. Um, but I think you guys, I, I didn't come into the show thinking I'd make a Martinez lineup, but I think you guys may have sold me on a, on a Martinez team or two here. Um, all right. So now we can move on to the first game on Sunday, the Houston Roughnecks at the Michigan Panthers. Uh, Houston is a two point underdog here. Total is 38. This game kicks off Sunday at noon Eastern. Um, to me, with Reed Sinet at quarterback, this game feels like much more of a, a pick em. I'm not exactly sure why Houston is a dog here, but we do know from, you know, just historically speaking, that sportsbooks aren't really adjusting based on starting quarterback or starting quarterbacks or really injury news at all. Um, Justin, I'll throw it over to you. Any, you see any value on Houston or any bets you like here? I do like that. We're getting two points. I think that's a good number there for Houston for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. I think um, obviously a team that could could win this game outright. Um, Reed Sinet, I, mean, I hate to like dance on somebody's grave, but um, having Jared Garantano, I'm still not 100% positive on how to say that. I think it's Garantano, uh, but Garantano, yeah. There you go. Uh, having him go down, uh, 
may may lift the offensive profile of this Houston team. Sinet came in and looked, uh, I thought, relatively sharp uh, in relief duty last week. And I was impressed when he played for the Brahmas last year. So uh, overall, like a guy I think has some skills and can spin it pretty good, um, could lift the overall profile of the offense. I took this under 38 and a half earlier in this week. I think it's at 38 exactly now. Um, and mostly because like the injury report revealed that these teams are kind of falling apart. Now where that changes a little bit, however, is like Mark Thompson could be on his way back for, for Houston this week. So we'll see. Uh, and who knows if Mark Thompson even like is going to, is still a difference maker, especially if he's banged up uh, at this point. Uh, it, it's hard to say. And, uh, but yeah, overall a team that uh, it, like Kirk Merritt's out for this team uh, probably for the year. Uh, though they're going through a quarterback change. EJ Perry's banged up. Marcus Sims banged up. Not sure he's going to play. John Howe Towers banged up. So uh, a bunch of guys uh, on the offensive sides of these balls that are uh, not in good shape for this game. Yeah, yeah. I uh, personally, I took Houston plus two. Bookmaker also hung Houston plus three. That was heavily juiced. So I got a little bit of that as well. Uh, Neil, do you see any value on uh, on bets here? I think I might take the other side. I think it, it is close. Like I, I kind of hate to do it because I do think that Sinet makes Houston better. Um, but I, you know, Michigan's defense has been so good, and they they held yeah. the Panther. Uh, they held Birmingham to twenty points last week. I think that they're a good enough defense that uh, they could could hang in there with the Roughnecks, uh, who have not been very good so far. So, or I mean, they could uh, hang a lead on, on a bigger than a three point lead on the Roughnecks here. So I think that I would actually take the. Panthers side of this one, uh, but I, I am with you that it definitely gives me pause that they have Sinet now, who just seems objectively better. So it's, it's uh, I'm not I'm not that confident in the take. Um, it's probably it's probably a stay away from me. But if I were to take that, I think it would be actually Michigan side. Over yeah, I think you over. could argue against taking Houston just on the basis that Michigan's biggest strength outside of their incredible kicker, Jake Bates, is their, you know, their run defense. And that, that front four especially is, is really, really strong. Um, and Houston's going to want to pound the rock and they, they may struggle to do so. Um, so injuries here, we do have a lot to get through. Justin already uh, alluded to this a little bit. But uh, so Justin Hall is dealing with a concussion. Uh, he suffered that on the final drive of Houston's week two game but he did practice on Thursday. He appears uh, pretty likely to play at this point. Anthony Ratliff Williams is dealing with a finger injury. He logged a limited practice on Thursday. I think he plays, but I wouldn't be totally shocked if he missed. And then Mark Thompson, who's been dealing with a knee injury uh, since March and hasn't practiced up until yesterday, tweeted a gif that said, daddy's back. And then he logged his first practice session of the season. Granted, that was only in a limited capacity. I do believe he plays. We have him projected in right now. On the Michigan side, EJ Perry was limited yesterday with an ankle injury after missing Wednesday's practice. I think Perry plays, but that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. He may sit. Danny Etling would draw the start if Perry can't go. Wide receivers John Hightower and Marcus Sims have not practiced. Uh, we definitely need to keep an eye on that. That would have pretty big implications for these Michigan wide receiver rotations. Um, all right, kicking things off on the Houston side, Sinet is legitimately interesting to me in tournaments. Um, we have him at, I believe, yeah, 3.7% own. That's, you know, that's pretty solid for one of the five quarterbacks who we know is going to play every single snap this week. Um, you know, his pass catching options, things are fairly condensed, uh, assuming Ratliff, William, Ratliff Williams plays. We know it's going to be him and Chisholm on the outside. Justin Hall manning the slot again, you know, need to make sure he's clears concussion protocol, but um, he, he is expected to play. Um, and, you know, Justin Hall, especially, I think, is a really, really talented wide receiver. The only issue for him through two weeks has been volume. Last year, he had plenty of big games with Kenji Bahar at quarterback for the Houston Gamblers. And I don't think Bahar is nearly as good of a passer as Reed Sinet is. Not that I think, you know, Sinet's some world beater, but he's certainly, you know, a pretty competent uh, drop back style passer. Um, so Justin, I'll throw it over to you here. How are you kind of feeling about this Houston Roughnecks passing attack? Because it's definitely going to go underappreciated in tournaments. And I, and I do see some upside here. Yeah, I think they're going to be relatively competent. Um, so yeah. And I think Justin Hall is sort of where the offense goes through. He's their major target earner. I think that's pretty clear. Ratliff Williams and Kism are, are running the routes. Saw a big play from Kism last week. Uh, overall, like I, I'm, 
I'm very hesitant towards, uh, or I, I'm monitoring deeply this Mark Thompson situation. So hopefully we should definitely get news on that tonight, uh, whether he's suiting up or not. If he does not suit up, I'm kind of interested in pairing TJ Pledger with Sinet because Pledger should play a pretty big pass catching role in the offense with Kurt Merritt out. So Kurt Merritt was a running back wide receiver hybrid type. Uh, he uh, was it his wrist that he hurt. Uh, anyway, he, he may be some sort of IR candidate, but I think at a minimum he's out this week. So yeah, there's a major pass catching running back role open up and we've seen that be pretty tasty uh, so far this season. So, Pledger, if Thompson sits, I think's uh, in great shape. Otherwise, I think it's pretty clear. Like, I don't see myself going down to Emmanuel Butler, Sauer Grayson, Isaiah Henney, those the sort of second wave of receivers. I think it's maybe getting a little too cute. Braden Bowman, however, at tight end is running a ton of routes. He's run over 80% of the team's routes in back-to-back weeks. Um, so I just hate to burn a spot on a, you know, a player whose upside is – likely still not very high. Uh, I think Hall could be an absolute target hog though this week if, if he's clears through Kentucky, through concussion. Yeah, I for what it's worth, I do think if Hall sits, Isaiah Henney would be quite interesting. Henny mm-hmm. was listed as Hall's direct backup on the depth chart. And Henny, you know, at least, you know, during his time in the UF uh, USFL was a, a great target earner and was a very talented player. That said, in week one, he only ran two routes. He also lost two fumbles. Um, so a pretty brutal week one for Isaiah Henney. It's, you know, and it's hard to predict, especially with this coaching staff. They have kind of erred towards general ineptitude. So it, you know, it would be hard to just say Isaiah Henny's in the Justin Hall role, but that would be something I'd be willing to bet on if Justin Hall somehow sits. Uh, Neil, any thoughts on this Houston passing attack before we talk about Mark Thompson? Yeah, I, I like Sinet. I think 7,900, uh, decent price. I mean, not that you don't really have to worry that much about salary in UFL football, but the, the 4% ownership looks really good to me. Came out right away, had 30 passing attempts, uh, 221 yards last week. Justin Hall, if he plays, I'm with you. I like him. Uh, you, you've been saying all year, Jake, that Justin Hall is the most talented receiver on the team. Uh, so, yeah, and, and he's you know still 6,500. So certainly I would, if he's healthy, I'd want to be stacking him up with Sinet. Uh, Braden Bowman, I do. I, I think I, I said I had interest in him last week. He, he uh, caught zero of his three targets last week. So, uh, you know, another guy. Like, like I said, I'm a sucker for the routes run. He's running routes. He ran the most routes on the team, 35 routes last week. Saw three targets, caught zero of them. I think I will go back to Braden Bowman uh, in my Reed Sinet lineups in particular. It, it is a good point that Justin makes. Like, you really, you, you, the biggest thing you're doing in UFL is in spring football is you're trying to avoid zeros, you're trying to avoid landmines. So it is like there's added risk in these guys that are like, yeah, I'm going to take a take a shot on this guy. Like, they, they clearly all have uh, risk of being a total landmine. But I think I see some, uh, some upside here and and maybe these are all again uh players that i would be more inclined to play in stacks you could i think play you know paul bowman uh outside of the stack i think within stacks i still i might also consider kiki chisholm as justin said i mean 25 routes run last week he converted the one he looked good he's a player that we've thought like uh you know has upside if he gets the opportunity and seemed like he's been gaining opportunities which i think is promising so I think that I could uh, see myself playing some Chisholm specifically in Reed Sinet stacks. I'm not sure if I would play him without Reed Sinet. Yeah, I think my most common Sinet stack is going to be Chisholm and Justin Hall. I mean, Justin Hall is kind of like, you know, what David Davis is to Case Cookus, where he's going to end up in just about every Sinet lineup you make. Um, and then you can kind of mix in those other guys. But Chisholm, Chisholm would be my favorite. Uh, Bowman is a little tempting. I mean, he projects as a decent value. But yeah, I mean, he has some real risk of, of just straight up zeroing. And I, I mean, I guess Chisholm does as well. Um, but I'd, you know, I'd rather, I think Chisholm is much more likely to be able to score you 20 DraftKings points than a guy like Bowman yeah. is. Um, all right, this backfield. So right now we tentatively have Mark Thompson projected in. Again, I think he's probably 70 to 80% to play. Um, I think, you know, for what it's worth, it, it's unlikely that they hold him back. Like, I, I feel like if he's active, right. he's he's going to be the bell cow. We saw this last year. He actually missed the first two games. Came in week three, immediate bell cow. Um And, you know, we can't forget just how awesome he was last season. He had the second best workload by weighted opportunity in modern spring football history. He was averaging 18.6 rushing fantasy points per game, which is just absolutely insane. He scored a touchdown in every single game but one last year. Um, He was just really, really, really good. 
Um, he is, you know, like I said on last week's show, when we were talking about the potential of him playing, he's the easiest comp to make in all of spring football because he's spring football Derrick Henry. Yeah, I, I treat him exactly like I would treat Derrick Henry uh, back when he was on the Titans, where, you know, you're mostly playing him in lineups that anticipate a Houston win or, you know, at least a tight enough game that Houston can stay in positive game script and feed this guy. Head coach Curtis Johnson has called Mark Thompson the team MVP multiple times so they they really really value mark thompson they you know he's right we we often talk about running backs not mattering in the nfl maybe that's true i do think mark thompson matters a lot to this houston team um and then of course you know as as justin sort of mentioned if uh mark thompson doesn't play uh then we'd be looking at tj pledger in really I think pretty much the same role where he'd be playing, you know, about 80% of snaps getting, you know, virtually every backfield carry and getting a good amount of receiving work. What's interesting last season was that even in games where Thompson and Pledger were both active, the team did le lean towards Thompson as their receiving back. Granted that wasn't worth a whole lot, right around two targets a game. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that's worth noting. I, I guess it's possible Pledger could see more passing down work this year than what we saw last year. Uh, but, yeah, Justin, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. Do you have any, any you know, takes or amendments you'd like to make on that? I, I got to say, I feel like I heard, like, patriotic music in the background as you were going on about Mark Thompson. I was just starting to get more and more excited about it. I had about uh, gotten to the conclusion that I was not that interested in Thompson. And then as you wax poetic about him, I'm – I'm in now. Like that was, uh, I'm sold. <laughs> like that was, that was good. But yeah, he, he is a difference maker and a league that lacks difference makers. Um, and I think that's important to consider here. So yeah, I think we're just going to have to wait on the news here. We're, it's about 5 p.m. Eastern right now, probably by nine or 10, we have the answer to this question. So we won't have to keep guessing. But yeah, overall, like whichever running back emerges here, I think is going to have a boost in sort of the offensive profile of the team with Synetic quarterback. They will benefit accordingly. So we've not seen Pledger uh, score uh, major fantasy points so far this year. I, I think that could theoretically change here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with you. And I will say that, you know, Mark Thompson does still have a very clear path to failure, much like Derrick Henry. If Houston gets down immediately or they just really struggle to run the ball here, they're totally incompetent offensively. You know, Thompson mm -hmm. just isn't going to do anything for you. And he is pretty expensive. Um, Neil, what's and sort Michigan of your... defense is pretty good also. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did mention that Michigan front four. Very, very strong. If you know, if I had to bet on what team's going to finish as the best run defense right now, it, it would be Michigan. Um, Neil, do you have any any thoughts here for for tournament? Yeah, I mean, so I think the, the best case scenario would be Mark Thompson being out, and then we can just play TJ Pledger uh, pretty easily. Currently, we have Mark Thompson projected, and I think that that is the most likely scenario. You haven't projected in, Jake, and you have him with 35% ownership, which that, that's the biggest downside here is 35% ownership. It's like if I – I think be, because we're getting that we're going to get the news tonight – I think that that's probably realistic. Uh, I, I wish that it was more like NFL where you're not going to get the news until after the games have started and then you can just plan on like the field's not going to adjust. But the field is probably going to get the news and adjust in time to get Mark Thompson into their lineups. Um, I still think 35% feels a little bit strong for for a guy who people like just haven't seen yet like i i don't know it's it's so hard uh this is why you do the ownership projections and i don't jay i don't even try because it's it's really hard to know like you know people playing spring football are they just all grinders who are going to know who mark thompson is and going to be able to adjust i i don't know i don't have a good read on that um i think if mark thompson is out yeah tj pledger is going to look great already last week i mean even with kirk merritt there tj pledger ran 22 routes last week uh so i think that he would take on a pretty big pass catching role from the running back position, which we've talked about is, is very valuable given the PPR points. Um, so the, the best case scenario I think would be Mark Thompson out just jam TJ pleasure. The more likely scenario Mark Thompson plays. Um, I think that I would probably be probably right around with the field with 35%. I don't think that I'm taking any huge stance here. Um, yeah, I think that it'd, he'd, he's probably worth, worth the price tag. Yeah, certainly a guy that, that I'll be looking to play. I think you could argue maybe our ownership number on Thompson is a little high because, I mean, yeah, Neil made some good points. We haven't seen him yet. Um, this is some late-ish late, late -ish breaking news potentially if he gets ruled in. So maybe the field won't be super quick to adjust. But to me, I mean, it's pretty clearly they're going to be him or Mateo Duran as your highest owned running backs this week. Um, I imagine both those guys will, will be in plenty of lineups. Um, all right, so... Uh, oh, we have the Michigan Panthers side of this game. I'm always live to try to skip at least one one team on on all these shows. Um, on the Panthers side, you know, obviously, 
EJ Perry has, he hasn't been playing well. Um, he did get benched for a drive last week. Uh, that benching only lasted three plays because Danny Etling immediately fumbled and then they brought Perry back in for the purposes of our projections. You know, if Perry were to sit, I basically consider Danny Etling the same guy. They have similar skill sets and seem similar amounts of turnover prone. Um, uh, and then, yeah, with these wide receivers, I mean, this is a this just feels like a real toss up. We really don't know if Marcus Sims is going to play. We don't know if John Hightower will play. Uh, Devin Ross is also on IR. He had a pretty bad hamstring pull and a kickoff return last week. Um, Justin, I'll throw it over to you. How are you guys kind of looking at this Michigan team? Um, yeah, what what are you looking at in terms of maybe projections, adjustments you would have to make based on some late breaking injury news? Yeah, we currently have it 75-25 Perry over Etling uh, in terms of expectation workload. Uh, I do think Etling will play. They want him to play. They need something a little bit more from the quarterback position. EJ Perry is not the guy there, I don't think. And then on the sort of receiving side, we just took Marcus Sims out. Like uh, for me, scouring through the practice footage to see if he sees Marcus Sims jersey number out there on the field uh, practice today. Have not seen him. Don't think he's practicing. That'd be sh- three straight DMPs for Marcus Sims, who uh, I think is pretty clearly the best receiver on this team. That's going to open up a role for somebody. I think Trey Quinn is sort of like the natural funnel for targets in this offense now with Sims gone. Quinn's always been a pretty good target earner. Um, And so I expect him to continue to do so. Jordan Sewell will step into a more prominent role. However, he's historically not been a target earner. Um, We've seen him be kind of a wind sprint all-star himself. And then uh, Devin Gray, a guy who did pop a little bit for the stars at at times last year, um, could be another guy. So we have have those three guys as sort of the starting rotation, uh, projecting Sims and Hightower out. And then uh, Samson Nakua, Puka's uh, little brother, right? Or o- older brother? Old, older, older brother. brother. Yeah, yeah, he's actually older uh, than Puka. Yeah. Uh, older brother is on this team now, uh, as is Ciose, I'll say Mariner. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we don't really know what to expect from those guys. We've not seen them in a Michigan Panthers uniform uh, this year. So uh, I do think that the top three there is pretty clear. Quinn, Sewell, and Gray. And my preference, I think, is Quinn, Gray, Sewell in that particular order. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in lockstep with you. We currently have Marcus Sims projected in. I'm ready to take him out of our projections in a few hours here. And we do have a similar split in terms of Perry Etling. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if Perry ended up playing every snap, but he probably needs to come out and you know actually look, look decent. I mean, he's just been th- throwing terrible balls. He's easily yeah. has the most turnover worthy plays of any quarterback. I said, you know, after week one that he had as many turnover worthy plays as all the other UFL quarterbacks combined, just absolutely insane. Um, how turnover prone he's at least tried to be so far. And yeah, I'm with you. I think Devin gray will end up playing more so on the outside than we've seen before in week one. He was pretty much exclusively in the slot last week. He did get some time on the outside and they're just really thin at outside wide receiver with no Sims, no high tower. And then I would think, you know, one of Nakua um, or the other player you mentioned, whose name I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, uh, would be backing up Trey Quinn in the slot. But again, we we just we really need the inactive news here um, yeah. to, to, you know, have a firm, firm conclusion. Uh, Neil, uh, how are you kind of treating this relatively vague situation, at least right now, um, for tournaments? You guys are scaring me off wanting to make a hero call here because I'm, I, I'm tempted to just be like lean into it. I mean, you say. If he's, you know, he needs to be playing well for them to leave him out there. I feel like the the range of outcomes is so huge here for EJ Perry. But when I see 0.7% projected ownership for a guy who had 33 pass attempts last week, and we do have like some decent receiving options here, I'm kind of tempted. I I think I'm going to take some shots. And I, I, you know, I've said it kind of the way I'm playing this week is I'm playing lower than the field of the quarterbacks in the final game and a little bit above the field on most of the other quarterbacks. I think this is another spot where, I mean, 0.7%, you don't need that. You could again, play in one of your 20 lineups. I think that you should though. I think that that is worth doing in a large field GPP. Now I, I also, I also have to keep in mind that I come from most of the large field GPPs I play are like 20,000 teams and you don't have, it's what four or 5,000 in UFL. So maybe I'm galaxy braining a little bit too much to want to play these guys, but I do think the ownership is going to be low enough and the volume potentially if they don't go to 25% DJ and if they do just give EJ Perry the shot and he does perform right away, he could pay it off with these really low salary receivers. 
it's a really cheap stack. So uh, I'll, I'll probably be above weight to the field on EJ Perry. That doesn't mean I'm going to have a ton. I'm not going 40% like I did with Teamu. Uh, I probably have 5% EJ Perry, something like that. Give him some shots. Hope that he does work out. Uh, but I, I like the receiving options. Um, again, you know, I've said that I'm a sucker for routes run, but I'm mostly I'm a sucker for routes run when the field isn't when when the field is just not playing players who are running a ton of routes. Uh, I that's my jam, and when we see that with Jordan Sewell, 44 routes run last week. He did get five targets too, so even though he's not a great target earner, five targets isn't bad in the UFL. Uh, he's only 4,300, so I do have interest in Jordan Sewell. Uh, Trey Quinn, we, we're giving 4% ownership. He's still only 6,600, 33 routes run last week. So um, I think that those, and, and Sims, if he's active, I'll have some interest in. Uh, but yeah, primarily for me, it will be Trey Quinn, Sewell, and Sims if he is active as the stacking partners. Um, and I think that you can play any of them uh, outside of stacks as well. I think they are all viable uh, one-offs as well. Yeah, I, I would I would lean towards uh, Trey Quinn and Devin Gray, but you know I'd consider Jordan Sewell to be to be more than fine. And I, I do think there is an upside argument to be made for Perry. I mean, you could you could definitely argue it's it's just way too cute on this slate. But I mean, he did throw for 370 yards in the UFL semifinals, uh, USFL semifinals last year against a really good Pittsburgh Maulers pass defense. So he's shown you know some ability at times. Granted, you you probably wouldn't believe it much after the first two weeks. Um, so he is a little interesting. Jake. I feel like I need to point out your bias here. Uh, being a Cincinnati Bearcat, oh. you just love your Devin Gray. You cannot get away from Devin Gray. Yeah. Uh, but but actually, it it last week uh, looked more legitimate. He actually ran 32 <laughs> routes last week, which was you know right below Trey Quinn is uh, for third on the team. So, uh, but really, you're just you're just a sucker for him because he's a Cincinnati no. Bearcat. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a lifelong bias of mine. It's it's never been effective in DFS until Travis Kelsey joined the league, and then playing nice. only Cincinnati Bearcats actually finally started making me some money. Uh, has not worked out though in the UFL <laughs> this year. Um, this backfield is a little interesting, at least when it comes to Wes Hills. Um, his workload was really strong. It looks like you know whoever the RB two is, whether it's Matthew Colburn or Nate McCrary, who I believe we currently have McCrary projected in. Um, regardless, uh, they're kind of an afterthought. It looks like it's you know it's mostly Wes Hills at this point. Hills looked really good in week one. Not so good in week two, but you know we can safely assume the workload's going to be there. He's a little expensive at 8,800. Um, he kind of feels like the Jordan Tayamu of running backs to me this week, where I just I just feel very neutral about him. Um, he'll make his way into into some lineups, but uh, I have a hard time making you know a great upside case or you know a great fade case. Um, Neil, do you have any thoughts on on Wes Hills? Yeah, it's really interesting because I I guess my impression of Wes Hills is that he is a like pure runner like does not have a ton of receiving upside but then i look at his stats from last week he ran 33 routes last week like that is kind of nuts saw four targets in the game so um you know sort of the opposite of what i like i played him thinking maybe he has 100 uh rushing yards kind of upside and he didn't do that at all he, he had uh seven rushing attempts for 10 yards last week but then bring on those those 33 routes run four targets suddenly that becomes kind of interesting to me um, I, yeah, I think 9% ownership feels fine to me. Um, hasn't really shown much, but, uh, the 33 routes run, I mean, that's like receiving kind of route share. And then he's also get, adding seven rushing attempts. So the volume is good enough, uh, that I, I do have some interest in West sales here, but probably, probably not too far from the field, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Justin, do you have a, do you have a take on, on West sales here? I want to play him so bad every week. Like, I love this guy. I love the fact, like, he, the way you feel about Mark Thompson, that's my Wes Hills, right? Like, he's he's a guy, like, we've seen uh, when he was a breaker, uh, just, like, handle a massive workload. I think he's like, Michigan's so bad. Uh, like, I, <laughs> the touches he gets are, like, so low quality um, that, like, he's going to have to, like, go make the play himself and just, like, rip a 40-yarder. Like, it's that's the only way he's going to get there or just hope that Michigan stays out in front in this game and they can actually feed him consistently. Now, I do think this will be a pretty close game overall. Uh, so maybe he'll stay scripted in a bit more than, say, like last week. But, uh, yeah, 
I want to play him. I believe in him as a player. I think he's good. He's got a great like receiving number, like in terms of targets. Like I, I, I have him getting as many targets as Jordan Sewell this week, for example, just behind Devin Gray in terms of targets. Plus, I'm telling you, he's going to get 58 percent of the rush attempts in this offense. So it's like eh, I like that type of profile. However, like you know, those are kind of low value targets. They're new line of scrimmage. They're not explosive targets, and uh, you know he, if they. <laughs> They haven't gotten into the red zone uh, a ton here lately. So, yeah. you know what? <laughs> Even though Justin, uh, his analysis was not all that glowing, I, I think that he, he sort of, as I'm thinking about it, as I'm listening to Justin, I'm like, that is kind of interesting. Like the, the route share plus the, the uh the rushing ability against this houston defense in particular is just i feel like even though justin wasn't really trying to talk me into it i feel like i may end up over the field on, on wessels just because i'm thinking man this is like you're running you're running on houston here and, and he is you know he is one of the few guys you can count on for some uh for, for a pretty good workload so i think i think i'm in yeah yeah i think he's going to be a guy especially sunday morning that i look at as you know a potential swap option off of mark thompson um especially if you know you guys think the ownership holds and thompson is right there with mateo duran um, as the most popular running back on the slate i mean hills is just going to be played less than thompson so to me that feels like a pretty easy swap if you're chasing but it's also tough because we just won't have a ton of information by then because so much of ownership will be concentrated on the final game um so i don't know you know how willing i'll be to to make those swaps before that sunday game and i i will say that i think Wes Hill's target ceiling is is maybe a little more capped than some of these other running backs just because Perry and Etling are such willing rushers and that's something we see it at every level of football running quarterbacks just aren't as willing to check down they'd rather they'd rather take it themselves but you know I definitely agree with you guys the the receiving workload is certainly encouraging um all right well we can now move on to our final game here the game of the slate St. Louis Battlehawks at the San Antonio Brahmas. This game kicks off Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern. St. Louis is favored by a point. Total here is 42. Uh, I have taken, and I, I quite like the over here, um, although, you know, especially early on in the season, betting some of these overs hasn't exactly been profitable. I, I think this is one of the spots to do it. Um, Justin, do you have any any bets you like for this game? I also took the over at 42 uh, earlier this week, and I took uh, San Antonio at plus two. I believe that's bet down to uh, a one-point spread at this point. So, um, yeah, no, I think this has uh, got high-scoring game written all over it sort of by default. Of course, that's no lock to happen. I think uh, f- from a betting standpoint, just you can kind of play the chalk option, which is like I think we know this – is a little bit under projector for score from a DFS option. Maybe time to get a little bit, uh, a little bit more cute. Yeah. Any, uh, any reason why you're backing uh, San Antonio over St. Louis? I don't have a strong take on the spread. Uh, no, just, I thought it w- should have been closer to a uh, pick em game. In fact, I think I had San Antonio favored by one when I did my initial numbers. Um, yeah. So actually I had San Antonio favored by two and a half. I thought San Antonio is a better team straight up. They're the two and O team going against the, the one and one team. Uh, I think Brahma's like, they showed me a lot last week and their ability to come back in the face of adversity. Uh, Garbers with the game on the, it's so funny. AJ Smith with the game on the line running GTFO, just get the free open. Right. So uh, I I love that so much. And it worked. (laughs) It's just like, let guys be athletes and don't like overcoach and script them to death. I, I thought that was great. I imagine AJ learned lessons through that game um, that I think will pay off in the future. St. Louis always plays cl- games close. Like that's just their MO week in, week yeah. out. So getting two points, I felt comfortable on the Brahma side. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, makes a ton of sense. Actually, I read an article where, where AJ mentioned that, uh, you know, he's taken a decent amount of inspiration from Madden and, and that madness, you know, kind of helped him call his plays. And I think you see that on the field. He, um, he calls a bit like a 12 year old playing Madden. And I, I mean, it works. 12 year olds playing Madden are, are really good. A lot better than, you know, some professional football coaches, believe it or not. Um, yeah. Neil, do you have any takes on the spread? I, I would imagine you're, you're backing our promise this week, right? Obviously, I'm back in our Brahmas this week. Uh, I, I also like Justin's call, e- even though it's a fade for me in DFS. Uh, you don't have to worry about ownership when you're just making bets. So, yeah, I think you, you take the over, you take the Brahmas. Uh, I think that that is, um, I'm right right in lockstep there with Justin. 
Yep, I also grabbed uh, the over 42 earlier in the week. Feel feel pretty good about that. Um, on the uh, When it comes to injuries, uh, really only one thing to talk about here. Landon Akers picked up a minor hamstring injury in the game last week. He's been limited in practice all week. I think he's probably inactive uh, because the team did re-sign slot wide receiver Calvin Turner. Um, that's really only worth monitoring if you're playing the showdown slate. I don't see it having a tangible impact on uh, any sort of main slate projections. Um, St. Louis side is clean. So that means we can talk about the battle Hawks here. Um, you know, obviously things start with AJ McCarron. I think, you know, I said in my week one preview, um, that, you know, I kind of thought going into the season, the only quarterback who had a chance to unseat McCarron as the QB one in UFL fantasy was Chase Garbers. And, you know, through two weeks, I, you know, I think it's safe to say that, that Garbers is probably the favorite to finish as the highest scoring quarterback in the league. Granted, that's, you know, not necessarily a knock on McCarron, who is surrounded by fantastic pass catching options. Uh, looked a little rusty in, in week one. You know, you could credit that to the maybe the Michigan defensive line. Uh, things certainly look better in week two. Um, we've seen the emergence of Marcel Aitman. Marcel Aitman has looked really, really good. He actually mentioned to the broadcast crew last week during their like midweek exclusive media availability that he was hurt uh, going into the 2023 season, was hurt for most of that offseason, also dealt with injuries during the 2023 season. So it does make sense that Marcel Aitman, you know, may have just taken a step forward and, you know, you could argue is ahead of Hakeem Butler. Uh, probably can't argue that he's ahead of Shepard on this uh, on this packing order. But, you know, thankfully, things are, are very, very condensed, which makes it great for great for fantasy. Um, Justin, I'll, I'll throw it over to you here. Um, everyone's going to want to play, you know, the Brahmas. Everyone's going to want to play the Battle Hawks. How are you sort of looking at AJ McCarron uh, stacks within the context of this game and, and the overall slate? Yeah, and pan over to me losing money on Marcel Aitman last year by playing him too much and me losing money on him this year by not playing him enough because I've been on the wrong side of that uh, in back-to-back -back years. Like, I thought his profile coming into 2023 – was excellent like he was an actual nfl player had looked good in games had played significant roles in games before and then of course for the reasons you outlined he, he doesn't get there and now I, I think that's changed completely and you're seeing that come at the expense of hakeem butler so i keep trying to figure out how how do i want to approach butler because he feels like such a, a key piece towards winning a GPP if you can get it right at the right time. So I definitely want to have some exposure to, to Akeem Butler because I think the field is growing increasingly confident in Shepard and Aitman as being sort of like where this offense runs out of. And, and I tend to agree. We have it projected that way as well. But we've seen Butler just absolutely take over games in the past. And I think that's going to happen again at some point. Uh, especially as defenses try to figure out how to stop Darius Shepard across the middle and Marcel Aitman down the seams. Like uh, it's, it's, they've, they've really been eating teams up. And so now you have the added layer of like, okay, uh, this maybe is actually even an interesting way to still play this game and not go the same way the field goes by taking Butler, you're punting points. Like you're taking an expensive guy and punting points away uh, from your projection. But you're basically saying like, I know everyone's going Shepard McCarron here. Or I know everyone's going Aitman Shepard McCarron, uh, you know, but I want to be the guy going Butler McCarron or Garbers with a Butler bring back. And that's how I'm going to get there. There's a lot of ownership here in this game, but I think for both teams, it's crystal clear, like where the ball's going in these offenses. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think those are great points. Akeem Butler is certainly a guy that, that I'm going to have a lot of interest in for tournaments. I mean, you know, you could really make a great upside case for any of these players. Darius Shepard is coming off a 12 target performance. Just the seventh time we've seen a player earn 12 or more targets since the start of the 2023 spring football season. So really, really strong workload for Shepard. Obviously Aitman has looked great. Um, and then, you know, you could make a downside case uh, for Aitman just based on, you know, that game last year in week 10 where St. Louis scored 53 points. Aitman was out there for basically every route, did absolutely nothing. He actually zeroed while uh, uh, Darius Shepard and Hakeem Butler combined for 60 DraftKings points, something, something insane like that. Um, so Aitman can totally disappear. I wouldn't take, you know, the last two weeks as, um, you know, just e like pure evidence that he's, you know, he's going to dominate every slate. But uh, yeah, Neil, I'll throw it over to you. How are you kind of playing this this game, especially given that, you know, I think Butler's going to be the lowest owned for sure, but all these guys are going to be, you know, fairly popular. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, and I, I'm similar to Justin in that I have only lost money on Marcel Aitman when I play him. I, I get him wrong 100% of the time. Um, it was it was pretty brutal last year. Um, yeah, I, I think that I'm playing the ownership game pretty heavily here, which is fade underweight to the chalk, overweight to the lower owned pieces where you can get a little bit of leverage. Hakeem Butler, I, I think, is is a very, very strong play at 15% ownership. He is expensive at 8,900, uh, so you're going to have to make some salary concessions elsewhere. But I really like Hakeem Butler at 15% ownership. He did run 32 routes last week. That's more than Marcel Aitman, just one fewer than Darius Shepard. He was targeted six times, so it's not like he's completely uninvolved in the offense also, uh, he has not put it together yet. Honestly, I I remember him last year having like some some drops issues early on. Like I I, I was not I've I've never been quite as sold as everybody else is on him as like a real talent. I think that he's uh, but but then he you know he's pretty good uh, at least from what I want. This is not based on stats, just based on watching. Pretty good with the ball in his hands. Like he can break tackles, uh, make things happen. Uh, but he definitely has had some some drop issues in the past. But I like him at it, now. Now that the ownership is low enough, now that we're down to fifteen percent ownership, uh, I'm willing to pay up to be contrarian. So I think Hakeem Butler, uh, when when factoring in ownership, is my favorite play on the team. I think that he just that, that's too low ownership for a player who can put up a hundred yards and two touchdowns. Like he, he does have that in his bag of tricks. Not going to happen all that often, but he is uh, he's he's been a pretty volatile player. Uh, he, he was last year, and I think he will continue to be. So uh, yeah, my my favorite play on the slate is. Uh, Hakeem Butler, and I, I'm going to punt those projection points and just hope that they uh, give it to Hakeem Butler because he's also great leverage on top of just being a really strong player uh, in his own right. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, he still has like pretty outstanding um, touchdown equity in this game. Um, and, you know, like Neil said, he, he may not be the most technically skilled receiver, but just athletically with the ball in his hands. I mean, he, he does not belong on a UFL field. He's really, really good, uh, you know, way too fast for his size relative to these other UFL players. So, you know, it's easy to make an upside case there. Um, before we move on to this backfield, I'm curious, you know, obviously if you're playing from behind and you have the, you have the salary swapping up to Butler makes a lot of sense. Um, would Blake Jackson be in play at all as a late swap option? Because, you know, he is out there. He's still getting some high value targets. He doesn't project well for us. I can't imagine he projects well anywhere. Um, Justin, would you consider Blake Jackson as like, you, you, you really need to catch up kind of play. If you asked me last week, I would have said yes. And then, uh, when you asked me this week, I say no, uh, because, He's coming off a week where he ran 21% of the routes for his team. Uh, that's really just not enough to get there. You're hoping that, you know, something changes philosophically in terms of like they want to go four wide or something like that. But overall, like just not enough consistent workload to, to make something happen. I, I'm surprised, though, because I love Blake Jackson heading into the year. Like I thought he'd easily play ahead of Marcel Aitman uh, or at least be kind of like right there with him in terms of route participation. And then I think we've got another problem on the horizon whenever Jacor Pearson like returns to this team. Where's the ball go then? I think things could go really wacky. Yeah, yeah. I'm really not sure where Pearson's going to fit into this wide receiver rotation. So that'll certainly be interesting when he does return. And I mean, who knows how that'll impact Blake Jackson. Um, Neil, do you have any interest in these like super fringe late swap options if you're if you're playing from behind here? Yeah, I feel like I got rugged on Blake Jackson last week because I played a ton. Like I, I even even more than I intended. I looked at it after the fact. I was like, "Damn, it, I have like I had like twenty eight percent Blake Jackson on my main slate lineups where he was like virtually unowned, and then even on on showdown he was only like eight percent owned." And I was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" Like I've never loved to play more. Like he's you know he, he didn't run the most routes on the team last week, but he was like up there. I think running seventy five percent around something like that. Uh, so he was uh, I thought a really really strong play, strong leverage play in a great offense and then ran seven routes last week. Saw, I think one target. So uh, whatever, I don't know. I don't know what happened there that the field, the field saw it and I missed it last week with Blake Jackson. It's not going to happen. Yeah. I saw two targets, I guess not going to happen again. I'm not playing uh, a 7,000 receiver who ran seven routes. I think that would be two galaxy brain. I would, I'll, I'll, I'll lean into my, uh, my love for guys who run routes and, and there are some low owned plays, even within this game uh, plays who aren't, who are running routes and not getting ownership. All right. I'm glad, glad you guys said that because I was I was somewhat trying to talk myself into maybe Blake Jackson as a fringe late swap option. But, you know, I think one of the toughest parts about this game, more broadly speaking, is that, you know, all of these guys are going to carry a good amount of ownership, which makes late swap, you know, swapping to the lower owned guy 
pretty difficult. I mean, I, you know, obviously we touched on Hakeem Butler versus um, Aitman and Shepard, but even Butler could push for 15% ownership. And if a lot of really good players need to swap, I could see it getting higher than that. Um, all right, this backfield, Mateo Durant earned 92% of weighted opportunity last week. That's the uh, highest percentage of backfield usage by any player in UFL history. Of course, we've only had two weeks, but still pretty great workload for a guy who was expected to be the backup last week, obviously got the start, had a really good workload. Um, this is kind of what we were hoping Wayne Gallman would be before the season started. Um, you know, I were loosely projecting him for about 75% of backfield usage. Um, and that's really great in an offense where they should be efficient running the ball because they spread so much and these defenses have to worry about them passing. Um, I will say that, you know, similar to Gallman, uh, you could make a downside case for Durant just based on, you know, maybe he loses red zone work to whoever the backup is. And we know St. Louis is probably going to throw the ball about 70% of the time in the red zone. So his touchdown equity might not be quite as good as, um, you know, his percentage of backfield usage may imply, but he still feels like a, a really strong play. And, you know, like I said earlier, he should be right there as the most popular running back option on the slate. Uh, Neil, I'll throw it over to you here. Um, any interest in Mateo Durant, over-owned, under-owned, any, any takes here? Yeah, I mean, the, the only great case you can make for not playing Mateo Durant is we do have him projected for 31%. And I guess the, the Brahma's defense is, uh, I, I, I happen to uh, believe that Jordan Williams is the best defensive player in the league, Brahma's quarterback, uh, so, so uh, sorry, uh, linebacker. Um, so I, there are, I, I guess those are, those are the reasons to not play him. Outside of that, he looked really good last week getting opportunities just, I mean, 14 rush attempts, which is strong, but 104 yards on 14 rush attempts is uh, really, really good relative to every other running back that we've seen in the UFL where everybody's just been so bad. That just really stands out as like, is this guy just a great, great running back? Um, but I think at 31% ownership, I'm probably going to be underweight to the field. I think that it's a little bit high relative to some of these other running backs who are, I think, like, I, I don't think we have a big enough sample size to know that Mateo Durant is as good as he was last week. We don't know if it was the Arlington defense uh, just giving up a lot to him. Uh, maybe maybe they were just, you know, focused on stopping the pass and allowing uh, St. Louis to run all over them. I don't know. I, I, I'd like to see a little bit more before I buy in enough to get to the 31% that we have the field projected at. Uh, so I think that I will be underweight to Durant. Uh, but it's really just because I think that he has... You know his ownership is a little bit too high. He clearly, clearly was good in his the only opportunity we've seen him have. Uh, he he also only ran twelve routes last week. So like from a route running perspective, there are running backs in the thirties, plenty in the twenties. So running just twelve routes, I don't love that. So I think uh, ultimately I'm going to be underweight to the field on Durant, but certainly one of the safer options. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to call Mateo Durant good, but I you know I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up with one of the higher yards per carry marks of any running back in this league. Because again, I mean, defenses really have to respect the speed of Darius Shepard, Akeem Butler, Marcel Aitman, and St. Louis spreads a lot. Like you look at these formations and they're, they're quite wide. So they should have big running lanes. They should be an efficient rushing attack. Um, Mateo Durant might not have to be that good to average, you know, like 4.8 yards per carry over the course of the season, which would, you know, pretty easily pace all, all UFL running backs with the way the season's going. Um, Justin, what are your thoughts on this backfield? Yeah, agreed. Like, I think jury's still out on whether, like, Durant's a supreme talent. Uh, he did go to Duke University, played for the Blue Devils, so that's a feather in his cap. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, he's – I think, like, you made the point that the offense is kind of like the rising tide lifting his boat, I think. And But I think that's going to kind of continue to be the case for Durant. Um, I think you're looking for running backs you feel confident are going to get some volume. But if, if ownership's going to like really condense around some of these guys, like I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd go wherever the ownership ain't, you know what I mean? Like I, especially at running back, we haven't seen like a running back put up why well, other than Durant last week when nobody played him, we haven't seen a running back put up scores that like made him a guy you had to have. So kind of like, you got to start using that piece of your brain to say, well, where, where, who is that roster of, of potential running backs? And then try to sprinkle in some of those guys. And if you think it's going to be a week where, uh, you know, er every running back scoring somewhere between, you know, six and 12 fantasy points, then maybe it's a good pay down week. And let's go hammer these receivers and, and play one of those backup running backs. Um, like, like Hagen's, for example, we mentioned so one of these guys that's cheap and just allows you to fit everyone else in, uh, you know, at running back, it's been a lot like quarterback tends to be, which is like, 
there's usually not a like guy you need, um, you know, and so you don't gain as much leverage as opposed to that 30 point wide receiver who does separate from the field significantly that you do have to have. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, all right. Unless you guys can, have any other can I amend one thing that I said earlier? Oh, it was yeah, earlier in the show, and just as we're talking about this, and as Justin's talking about, uh, Justin actually just mentioned the guy that I was thinking I, earlier. I said I think that I would cut the split the difference between Cam Harris and Darius Hagens in terms of ownership and get to around ten percent each. But I'm just remembering watching the game and thinking Darius Hagens looked so good, and like I think that there is some chance that he just does have more of the workload. So you know, I was thinking, well, Cam Harris, you know, we we think he may have been hurt. Maybe that's why Her Darius Hagens was getting opportunities. But I thought he looked really good so i kind of think that i would rather be overweight to both of those guys and just cut into my mateo durant and my mark thompson a little bit more and lean into just the guy that i thought looked like he was good last week well and dc yeah. gets to play against the team that just got lit up by mateo durant. exactly yeah um, yeah that that matchup angle too yeah yeah no i think i think that makes a ton of sense that's uh that's pretty sharp any other thoughts on st louis before we move on to the brahmas nope all right um Chase Garbers leading this team. He's looked, uh, you know, obviously looked pretty poor as a passer through three quarters last week. But overall, this is a very competent passing offense. And he's got, you know, really great uh, rushing touchdown equity and, you know, just overall rushing equity, too. So Garbers is, you know, I think everyone's QB one in terms of projection this week. It, you know, makes a ton of sense. I don't know if there's really a whole lot to say about him other than, you know, he's a pretty strong play and probably has the best floor of any quarterback, given the given the rushing work. Um that he's that he's been faced with uh this backfield i think is is really interesting before we get to these wide receivers so we've only seen three total red zone carries from the backfield over the course of two weeks they've all gone to john lovett um and just from watching the film lovett is the goal line back i i wouldn't be surprised if mcfarland stole some inside the 10 carries over the course of the year but it seems very clear to me especially based on you know the personnel groupings they come out in for uh, two-point conversions and one-point conversions lovett is their guy and to me, on lineups that aren't playing Chase Garbers, um, I think John Lovett makes a lot of sense because if he scores a couple touchdowns here and he's, you know, Higgins is probably a better option in terms of median. Uh, you could make a case for some of these other backup running backs. If John Lovett steals a couple touchdowns, it's going to be pretty hard for Garbers, uh, like Garbers double stacks to end up in the optimal lineup. So I see myself leaning into, you know, a good amount of love it pro probably significantly more uh, than what we have projected by the field, you know, 3% ownership by the field. I'm going to play a lot more than that in my lineups because I, you know, I like him in, if this game, you know, shakes out in kind of a weird way, I, I could certainly see love it ending up with one of the highest scores among Brahma's players and, you know, certainly uh, hurting Garbers. So uh, Justin, I'll, I'll throw it over to you here. Um, any love for, uh, for John Lovett? Uh, if well, I would not build with John Lovett in my original lineup, but I would use John Lovett as late swap option here, because yeah. I think he, if in your original lineup is going to introduce more leverage than I think you're going to need. So if your team's crushing heading into the late game, like I, that to me is, is, uh, over leverage in that particular situation. But, uh, in the situation where maybe you are chasing, you, you put up a couple receivers who got you seven fantasy points or something like that, then dare I say it's love it or leave it. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I really love that. Um, Neil, any thoughts on, on John Lovett? Well, first of all, kudos, Justin. That, that was just great. That was great. <laughs> Lead in for great finish to your, your thought. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it. I also love that thought. Um, <laughs> I, I almost did the pun accidentally there. No, I, I think that that was a, a great, great thought that he was a fantastic late swap option for all the reasons you mentioned. Great leverage on a very chalky Brahma's team in general. Uh, he actually ran more routes than McFarland last week. And I got to say, I, I ended up playing a ton of McFarland last week as I was getting away from the chalky Brahma's. I was like, well, I'm just going to lean into this leverage piece, this running back. And he was god awful uh so I, I think that you might be right that john lovett maybe maybe he takes on more of a role than we saw last week still uh you know three rushing attempts to mcfarland's five last week they're they're not running the ball a ton but you know 13 routes run he is cheaper he is getting the goal line look so i like to call on lovett um i think that you could play him uh you know in your original lineups but i but i really i particularly like justin's thought of he's a great late swap option in lineups where you're playing from behind that that's really sharp 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. I, I do plan on, you know, being overweight to field in my original lineups, but I would imagine, you know, he and Butler are going to be the two guys that I really, really prioritize if I if I need to late swap here um, because I'm chasing. Um, I guess, he, I mean, you could still make an argument for McFarland. Maybe he could rip off some, you know, some bigger runs or maybe he could steal some touchdown equity. I think the, you know, the biggest problem that this backfield is facing is that it's, you know, one of the two or three least valuable in the UFL by both uh, usage and actual production. So we're just not getting a ton of like overall fantasy value. And that's because, you know, the team's so pass heavy and because Garbers is stealing a good amount of those high value carries, which is pretty unfortunate. Um, when it comes to pass catchers, I mean, you could, obviously it's a lot like St. Louis. You could make a great upside case for John Trey Kirkland, Marquez Stevenson, Cody Latimer to me, um, you know, Again, I'm, I'm going to play a ton of all these guys, but Marquez Stevenson is pretty clearly my favorite. Uh, the best fantasy stat that we have for wide receivers in, in all of fantasy football isn't yards per route run. It's actually first downs per route run. Marquez Stevenson leads all players in the UFL in first downs per route run. Um, and he just looks great. I mean, if I could bet on anyone to rip off a big play for San Antonio, I, I think I might actually put him ahead of John Trey Kirkland because he just looks so fast, so good out there. Um, big fan of Marquez Stevenson, but you know, again, I think, you know, between him, Kirkland and Latimer, you can, you know, it's really easy to double stack Garbers. You could even triple stack Garbers. Um, yeah, Justin, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. How are you kind of viewing these San Antonio pass catching options? Yeah, no, I think it's just kind of pick your poison there with Kirkland, Stevenson, Latimer, and then Justin Smith is like, uh, I'm sure Neil's favorite player on the board. I know. A ton of routes. <laughs> but, and like, uh, but Justin Smith is like objectively an exciting player if he could ever get targets headed his way. Like he's, yeah. to me, like uh, a tremendous, uh, A, he's a tremendous point per dollar play every single week of the UFL season so far. And then also like has that upside that you're looking for as well. So yeah, I don't have a lot to separate. Like I think Kirkland's like the most like locked in guy, but at, to your point, uh, Stevenson's going to be the chain mover in this offense. That's great job security and role security. It really boosts his floor. Uh, whereas like a guy like Kirkland can just go missing for periods of time in certain game scripts. I was surprised to see the same true for Cody Latimer. I thought he would have been a bit more of a staple. Like in week one, he just disappeared completely. But in week two, popped back up for a good fantasy score as well. Caught the game-winning touchdown. Uh, and that was pretty cool. But I think Latimer uh, is one that it's probably subject to just being for the kind of the forgotten man in the rotation. As Kirkland and Stevenson, I feel pretty confident are going to be target earners week in, week out. Yeah, the easiest guy to make a downside case for is, is definitely Latimer. He's losing some routes to Alizé Mack. It is good news that in any sort of obvious passing situation, Alizé Mack is is nowhere to be seen. It's it's going to be all Latimer. Uh, but there are certainly scenarios, you know, uh, a situation where San Antonio maybe gets up by multiple touchdowns. I wouldn't be surprised if Latimer finishes this game with like a 65% route share, which obviously isn't great when you're eating that much ownership. Uh, Neil, um, what are your thoughts on these San Antonio pass catchers? Yeah, I'm realizing that like every sharp, fantasy football analyst I know like talks all the time about yards per route run and then I'm doing I'm like no I want routes run per yard I just want the guys who are <laughs> the least efficient are the guys that I'm playing all the time and I uh and that's but it, you know that, that's the difference I guess DFS from uh from season long I, I lean a little bit more into the less uh productive on a week-to-week -week basis guys and hope for outlier performances uh and and Justin you did you nailed it I am a fan of Justin Smith here just as a he led the team in routes run last week. Forty, I mean, he tied with Kirkland, ran 43 routes last week. That is an outlier in the XFL, and he's only 3,600, and he's coming in at 7.3% ownership. So I will have him in lineups. I'll be overweight to the field coming in, but he's also a fantastic, like, you know, you're, you're playing from behind, and you need somebody that the field isn't going to be on. Leave $5,000 on the table and, and yeah. play some Justin Smith because he could really put up a big score if he does connect on some deep balls. So, uh, yeah, I, I Kirkland, Stevenson, Latimer. Yeah. They, they're all obviously good plays. They're all obviously chalk also. And, and I, I put this stat out there on Twitter, uh, last week reminder. So, so everybody's playing the Brahmas this week because they have been dominant and you know, it's, it's my team. I, I want to be playing the Brahmas, but with under three minutes left last week, the showboats could have converted a third down to essentially end the game if they had done that if they had converted that third down john trey kirkland ends with 4.6 fantasy points 
Uh, Garbers ends with 11.72 fantasy points. Stevenson ends with 16.3, so already pretty good. And Latimer ends with 9.3. Everybody other than Stevenson would have been a pretty big letdown if they had just been able to convert in at the end of the fourth quarter there. Then, of course, the, the Brahmas just go nutso in the, in the final three quarters, make a big comeback. So it all ended up being worth it, even though it killed all of my lineups, took money out of my bank, uh, out of my wallet. Uh, it was still worth it because the Brahmas did end up somehow pulling off the win there. But I do do just want to like recognize that like there is like the the range of outcomes for all of these teams is wild. It's so volatile. So the fact that people are really leaning into it, I'm probably going to be underweight to all of these chalky receivers just because I'm leaning into the volatility. I'm playing the guys that are not going to get the ownership. Uh, and of course, these are the guys that are more projectable. Um, they're they're obviously more likely to get there than the players that I'm playing, but uh, I'm I'm gonna lean into that volatility a bit, and I'll probably be underweight to the field. On we have Kirkland at 47%, Stevenson 40%, Latimer at 37%. I'm gonna be underweight to the field on all of those guys. The only receiver that I probably will be overweight to the field on is a seven percent owned Justin Smith here. Yeah, I mean it's it's just tough to eat that much ownership on any of these UFL offenses when you know, like Neil pointed out, they can all easily fail. I mean, San Antonio was a play away from basically being a total dud for uh, for us last week. Um, and one of the, I mean, I'm glad we we already covered it, but one of the things I was going to bring up was, yeah, how much salary would you guys be comfortable leaving on the table? You know, in some of these San Antonio St. Louis late swap situations, Neil, it sounds like you're more than willing to be pretty aggressive if you had to oh, yeah. swap off a guy like Cody Latimer for Justin Smith. That'd be, that'd be no problem for you. No no issue for me at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine. I don't even look at it, to be honest. And, and there, there are benefits to, you know, I, I don't, salary on a main slate is not something to look at. Like showdown, sometimes I'll force leaving salary on the table. On a main slate, uh, for, for UFL, I don't even think about salary. I'm totally, totally willing to leave a lot of money on the table. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that makes sense. One of the ways that I think I'm going to try to, you know, handle that is on, you know, teams with Stevenson or Shepard, uh, ideally leave enough to get up to a guy like Hakeem Butler, I, I think could be pretty sharp. Um, Justin, do you have any, you know, final late swap tips before we get out of here? Yeah, and no, I think that's exactly it. And um, so saving, like intentionally building with a salary cap on your sort of optimizer settings, I think is kind of a nice way to do that. So you can ensure your ability to swap on the guys you want throughout the uh, throughout the course of the weekend. Um, but yeah, like if you're if you're in a hundredth place with sixty PMR and there's some guys ahead of you, you know, there's ten guys ahead of you that have sixty PMR, all of the skill positions, like that's it doesn't matter like you get no bonus points for spending all the salary right so yeah. uh go ahead and go down to like the highest projected guy that you're relatively confident the 10 guys in front of you are not playing and, and try to score your first place win here because there it, it does you no good to play john trey kirkland in that spot with six other guys and fin have a cap ceiling of finishing in seventh place right so um, that, that, that does you no good of seventh place is what steak knives, I think, uh, in the big GPP. So, um, yeah, stay away from that. And Neil, I'll say like, I apologize that you lost money on that epic comeback. The fantasy gods saw it so kind in their eyes to take it out of your pocket and put it into mine for what was maybe the best sports betting moment of my life. We just got sports betting in North Carolina one month ago yesterday. And so, uh, yeah, hit, hitting the 70 to one. On, oh, that's right. I saw that. That is amazing. Oh, yeah, on I the Brahma's live it. line was, was like spring football has arrived, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, would you, would you say, I, ha I actually haven't looked at like, you know, what kind of live lines offshore mm -hmm. offshores are posting, but I would imagine, um, you know, most books are probably just using their standard sort of NFL live line calculations. And those can't really be applied to the UFL because of the conversion rules and the fourth and 12. Um, do you have yeah. any, you know, sort of live betting advice given that you just came off that, that awesome hit? I, I, what's funny is like, I was literally waiting for this exact scenario to unfold. I didn't think it would get to 70 to one. I mean, I, that was a pretty massive number. So I was more yeah. than happy to bet into that, but like, the, the idea of like maintaining possession and the other team who's got the lead at the time, never getting the ball back is mega appealing in this league. And so whenever you see a team that's down, you know, it's nine points is a one possession game, but you know, 10 to 16 points or so like that's, you're well within striking distance to make sure that the uh, team with the lead never gets the ball back. If it's like under five minutes left in the game, um, you know, just, and it like, we see this all the time in the NFL too. Like when, when the, 
when your back's against the wall and you're staring at a loss, if you don't just air it out and move quickly and rapidly and just let it all hang out, like you'd see teams playing freely and they make plays and they're picking up yardage 25 yards at a time and it looks easy and the defense is in prevent. So yeah, I think, um, I think the, the sort of live booking technology is underestimating the comeback potential that exists in the UFL broadly. So just be looking for spots where that live line gets into, you know, you got two teams that are projected to be a two point spread. Uh, there really should be no point in the game while it's a one score game that somebody's like, plus 300 or worse to to come back and win i think yeah yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and i would imagine even more so than when you're betting you know ufl spreads and totals this is really a situation where you will you will want to shop around and and kind of see the various live lines at, at different books because i i would imagine mm-hmm. there will be you know some pretty big discrepancies across the board um you guys got anything else on on this slate or this final game before we we get out of here I think we covered it pretty well. All go, right. Go Brahmas, but also don't put up a lot of fantasy points. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. You heard it here first. Uh, Justin, shout out, shout out your stuff. Tell everyone what you got going on. Yeah, guys, we're, uh, we're heading into week three of UFL. Uh, if you're not at Run the Sims, highly encourage you to go check us out. I can never have too many subs to too many spring football sites. So go check out Run the Sims uh, for our spring football product. That's you can run simulations. Uh, a grand total of up to um, 50,000 simulations on our showdown slates, 10,000 on our on our main slates, and see which lineups uh, grade out positive e- EV for you. So, yeah, go check us out at runthesims.com. Uh, got the Discord popping. Uh, you guys do as well. But uh, I joke that, you know, we're kind of rivals uh, heading into the season. Like, I, we're trying to outwork you. You're trying to outwork us. We're all looking for nuggets and news. And then I think by this point in the season, like, some consensus starts forming. It's fun to uh, let the guard down and just kind of collaborate. I think it's great and look forward to like finding ways to continue to make spring football kind of a thing. I know it's uh, not everybody is on board and that's okay, but uh, like uh, there's, there's a community of people who are really into it. And and I think that's, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it can be a, you know, a positive sum game for, for everyone involved and, you know, growing the ecosystem, I think should be you know, a big priority for, for anyone who's doing content. And, and really, I think it, it comes down probably to the success of the, the league more than anything. You know, if the UFL can, can stick around and, you know, be something that people are looking forward to five years from now, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to a point where there are bigger contests and, you know, probably more sites providing spring football content as well. So that's really great. And I, you know, I love run the Sims, always something I look at every single week. I'm always playing around with your guys, Sims stuff, looking at your, projections do fantastic work over there at rts so definitely check them out at run the sims.com um all right guys well that does it for the week three fantasy points ufl breakdown we just talked about a four game slate for over 100 minutes that makes me quite a happy guy um i wish everyone good luck this week and i will see you at the top of the leaderboards 